Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. In this episode, you'll meet former Wall Street Journal correspondent Neil King. He joins us to recount his 26-day solo walk from Washington, D.C. to New York City, exploring historical places and meeting local residents. His postings on Twitter developed followers who joined him for part of the walk, guided him to local sites, and even helped him navigate rivers by boat. Mr. King plans to publish a book that will share the lessons of his journey. Our conversation will begin in just a moment. Neil King, Jr., well, welcome to C-SPAN, first of all. It's a pleasure to be here. I wanted to start our conversation with a photo that you posted on Twitter on March 29th. This is you in Washington, <laughs> D.C., as you're beginning a walk from Washington to New York City. So how and why did this long sojourn come about? You know, I had puzzled over this for years, actually, where it had struck me, uh, if you wanted to walk to New York from Washington, D.C., and I live right by the Capitol, what would it entail? How would you do it? I was kind of taken by the idea largely because those of us who live in Washington or live in New York, we do our best to just blaze between those two places. We, some of us call it the Acela Corridor, which is, I like to joke, is a corridor named after a shortened, accelerated version of the word accelerate. Um, And even though that train isn't that fast, it's still our fast train. And um, so I was kind of fascinated if you were to sort of walk through the Acela Corridor, what would that entail? Um, and I was just taken by kind of the absurdity of it. And then I started to look more closely at the history of that whole area, what routes I might actually take, and, uh, and it became more alluring and more fascinating. And then I finally got around to doing it. You wrote on social media, the trip was always intended as a kind of history-infused exploration of our national psyche. But the events of the past year, protests for racial justice, the November election, the Capitol riot, gave the project an additional sense of urgency. You want to tell me more about that? Yeah, it was interesting. You know, I was going to do it last year at the exact same time, so right at the end of March. And as we know, the end of March last year raised a lot of complications. So I had to scratch it. Um, there was a good... It was quite fortuitous in a way that I... Uh, I'm not saying that COVID happened in the meantime, but doing it a year later with all that had happened, all of us being shut in, all of us being, you know, walking around behind masks, that long COVID winter, as we call it, which was a pretty horrific stretch. The events we saw play out January 6th the, uh, at the Capitol, which I live right nearby, the contested election. There was a lot of bad blood in the air overall. So it made my desire to go out, really, I think it was the fifth day of spring, and just walk through a spring, see it unfold, and um, look up close and very slowly at the country I was going through and meeting people along the way and trying to kind of understand where were we as a country at the moment. I mean, this isn't science, right? I'm not engaging in some scientific endeavor, but um, it really made the setting, historical setting, the moment, just so perfect, really, in so many ways. You're a writer, and this is in the tradition of some very famous writers like Tocqueville, Mark Twain, Jack Kerouac. Did you feel that sense of writer's legacy as you were doing this trip? Uh, Profoundly, actually. It's funny you asked that question because... um, If you go back to the 1830s and 40s in particular, when you talk about Tocqueville, 1831, there was a stream of travelers that came almost entirely from Europe to the young United States. Let's figure this place out. Let's travel through it. It They were all travel logs. And they would all go to Boston or they would go to New York or one of those. And then they would come down, more or less the route I did, to Washington. And um, I had read a lot of those accounts. Um, and they were fascinating for a bunch of reasons. And when I write a longer version of all this, I'm going to touch on a lot of those accounts. But, yeah, my desire in some ways was to go into that part of the country with that kind of wide-eyed, never having seen it before, almost a kind of naivete that a lot of those people brought when they came to the United States and just try to judge it on what I saw. So it was very much in that tradition. We've got your map, which you also posted on social media. So let's take a look at it. Sure. And, and in general, how long did this trip take? That's a <laughs> it's long, so funny long to see. walk. <laughs> so high, like home down the corner. It took, um, well, it took 26 days of various forms of motion. But I'll point out that in York, Pennsylvania, I spent an entire day. In Philadelphia, I actually spent three days doing a lot of things, but I wasn't moving. In um, 
Lancaster, actually, which is right near Ephrata. You see it there. I also spent a day. And then in Princeton, I spent a day. So there were basically five days of non-motion and about 19 days of motion. Um, my days averaged, the longest day was down in um, northern Maryland. I did about 24 miles. That was pretty gr- grueling. That was the third day. And then um, uh, the days averaged probably about 14 miles, the days that I was really moving. And how much pre-planning was involved? You know, a lot, but I also allowed for a lot of slack for things to just happen. So when you, it's fascinating because if you, you see Olney there, if you go up into that area, it's actually extremely hard to find lodging of any kind throughout that whole area up to York. So through that whole area, I did Airbnbs in people's houses. Olney was a very interesting inn that I stayed in. When I got to southern Pennsylvania, I stayed at a really interesting inn there called the Jackson House. Um, and, uh, and then in York, I stayed in some Airbnbs. But you really had to plan the lodging. And then there were places that I also planned to meet various people because I didn't want to leave all the encounters with people up to chance. And so I met with historians and writers and various people like that. But in, in many ways, the best meetings were the serendipitous ones that just came out of nowhere. How did COVID, we're still in the midst of the pandemic, how did it impact this process? You know, surprisingly little. Uh, A year ago, um, when it was pretty clear that COVID was coming on fast, various of the places that I wanted to go were closing, and I was being told that they were closing. In this case, a number of those places that I wanted to go were opening. Um, You know, it didn't really, there were, you know, I had my mask, I put it on when necessary. I was in uncrowded places. When I dealt with people, um... For the most part, they were either vaccinated or we were, you know, across some distance. It wasn't really that big a factor, oddly enough. How did your family react to the idea of this? Uh, a certain amount of amusement. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people, especially when you say, I'm going to walk between these places, they see you walking up like I-95 and going into service stations and, you know, eating Cinnabons or something, you know. So it's kind of like, what? But um, there was a certain amount of bafflement. But over time, I was very persistent and stubborn that it was going to happen. And um, they were, well, I mean, totally supportive and generally appreciative. So as you were coming into the studio, you remarked how you used to be on this network all the time. I went back into our video library and found your very last appearance on the network. But oh. I wanted to show a little clip oh, no. of that. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> Flashback. This is your life, right? I did a kind of very informal, informal poll of my... Uh, people that I was with at the table last night, CEOs, of the three that I asked what would be the one single thing you would like Congress to do, one said corporate tax reform, the other said uh, immigration reform, and the third said, yes, both of those. Uh, (laughs) So if we were to look at the corporate tax reform, uh, Senator, are you of the mind, uh, coming off of what the congressman is saying, that your own caucus uh, can actually rally around a distinct corporate tax reform plan that it would then advance? And what would that then look like? There's a lesson. We're still talking about the same things, corporate tax reform, yeah. all these years later. That was 2014. So what's been your journey from the last time we saw you to today? Um, so at the end of 2016, I left the journal, and I went off and did some kind of consulting research work with some friends of mine at a firm, uh, which was fun, through 2019. And then at the end of 2019, I decided to uh, kind of take an adult gap year and do a bunch of things I wanted to do that were writing-related. Um, one of the things was going to be the walk, and then uh, COVID got in the way of that. I ended up taking a job um, with the Rockefeller Foundation where I'm doing various uh, writing and consulting work with them. Um, it's not an official formal job, but a kind of retainer-based job, and so that's what I've been doing since then. You also po- posted a rather um, poignant essay on social media about dealing with some health problems oh, yeah. during this time, yep. which were especially... Uh, uh, thought-provoking during the COVID year. Can you tell a little bit of that story? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, I mean, actually, it's all these things play into everything. Um, that at the end, or at the end of the summer of 2017, I had a one of those diagnoses when you hear the word cancer, told to you by a doctor, never fun. And I embarked on a whole journey that was the kind of classic bracing cancer journey of chemo and radiation and surgery and very bad odds at the start which I advise anyone going down that path to not pay attention to the odds, because in a lot of ways they're not really that true. Um, But it was two and a half or maybe even three years of a lot of uncertainty, and um, as I like to say, it kind of reset my sense of time 
and it kind of um, cleansed my vision of a lot of things in ways that I felt um, I feel grateful for now. Um, at least at the moment, I like to say I don't use the term cancer-free. I like to say that I'm in a clearing, but I'm not really in the clear per se. I don't know. Who knows? But Who knows I, about a, any day, right? Right. But uh, are you feeling well? Totally. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Some other projects I found all related to this period is something called Gotham Canoe. <laughs> what is that? So when I left the journal, and I, I do a lot of writing of different kinds, and I, you know, I published this piece in the New York Times that was about cancer and COVID, and I've written some things for the Atlantic and some other places, but I really wanted to have some freedom to just put things out without having to wait for somebody to approve it or edit it or whatever. So I created this site, Gotham Canoe, which is really uh, about kind of finding wildness and beauty anywhere, including in cities, and which is part of the Gotham part. And uh, I post things there and write for it, and then a lot of other people, primarily friends, but not necessarily always friends, have written a variety of things for it too. So it's been a fun venture. It's not a for-profit venture. It's just a, another place to post writing. Another project, and this does tie into the walk that uh, people can find online, is a rather long piece that you wrote about searching for Frederick Douglass's roots. Uh, what was that? Why were you so intrigued with that and spent so much time? Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because um, it really feeds into this all of this. You know, so during the COVID year, I had the pleasure of being able to spend a lot of it on the eastern shore of Maryland, so across the Chesapeake um, in Talbot County, uh, and I was doing my work remotely like a lot of people. And while I was there, I became not just aware of, because a lot of people know that Frederick Douglass spent most of his teenage years in that area. Obviously, he was still an enslaved person at that time. Uh, this is being the 1830s, late 1820s and 30s. And um, But what I really became obsessive to me was that this field, this farm where he had been sent to spend a year when he was 16 with this notorious slave breaker was like a mile and a half from where I was staying. And um, so I kept going to this field there, when there was a very famous fight that Douglas had had with this slave owner, Edward Covey. And I just became obsessed by, by how it was unrecognized. There was no notice of any kind that he had ever been there. And I started to kind of do almost like an oral history project where I started talking to people in the area to see what, um, how many people knew that Douglas had spent this year there. And it really drove home two things for me that were really important about the walk as it came up, which is the importance of place and of acknowledging the history that happens in place, sometimes in certain places that might have been washed away or forgotten. And also a kind of different view of this fight that we're all having over which statues to have and which ones to maintain or which ones to tear down. And I guess part of my point is we can have that debate about which statues to take down. There's healthy aspects to it. But we should also be debating which things to note and which things to either celebrate or highlight that we might not already be celebrating or highlighting. And a lot of my walk was kind of animated by the desire to find those places and to be in those places. Yeah, so all the threads come together. Yeah. You know, before we get into the more specifics of the walk, I think a lot of people, at least I was, and uh, Nick Raval, my producer, was very curious about the logistics around a, an enterprise like this. So I had a series of questions just about how you get ready and how you prepare. So yeah. what shoes did you choose for a walk? <laughs> that, that I'm still wearing them. <laughs> you know, there are these particular lightweight walking shoes that had great treads. And um, for my purposes, I really wanted them to be um, what, to dry quickly and not have it matter if I walked into rivers with them because I did do a moderate amount of fishing on the trip. So it was I, one pair of shoes for the entire walk? Yep. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, a, that's a great commercial for that brand, whatever it is at yeah. some point. And how did you prepare uh, for the physicality of it? Did you do practice walks and get Well, I did a ready? lot of walking uh, every day, so I was averaging probably 9 or 10 miles a day every day for the year um, as the walk drew near. And uh, for the last month or so, especially after I'd found the pack I wanted to take with me, I would just put the weights in it that would equal about 19 pounds, 20 pounds, which is what I brought, a little less than that, actually. So I would train my back and that kind of thing. So I'd do, you know, 12, 13 miles a day with my pack on. And that really did make a big difference. What was in that backpack? Oh, when I left? Well, you know, it's funny. If you add up the weight, I took my laptop. Those are about 2.1 pounds or something, the charger. Um... I had very few clothes. I had, I think I brought essentially three very lightweight 
kind of thermal shirts. Um, obviously, a rain slicker kind of jacket, a warmer Patagonia kind of um, down jacket, and uh, a couple of pairs of socks. And I just did, I got into the habit of every night I would do some amount of laundry and just hang it up. And then I would just constantly be turning it that way. I went very minimalist. Um, I had a couple of books, oddly, but um, so, uh, you know, I was very, I tried to be very spare in what I brought. And still, some people might even scoff at 18 pounds and say you probably could have gotten to 12 pounds or, you know, but it was a good amount. It was, it was fine. The weight was never really an issue. And what about electronics? What did you bring? Yeah, I mean, I brought it, you know, we call them phones, but the reality is those things are everything but phones. Well, they're phones also, but cameras, recording devices, map, you know, mapping. So, yeah, I brought an iPhone, which was invaluable in every imaginable way, and I brought a laptop. Did you use GPS for the walk? I did. Not always. I also did have the torn out pages of detailed atlases that I used a couple of times, which were helpful. But um, I did use the GPS a fair bit. How did the weather treat you? Surprisingly and astonishingly well, considering that April, as we know, as someone said, is the cruelest month, but it also is one of the rainiest months. Um, I only had one day that was seriously complicated by heavy rain. Otherwise, I got hit a couple of times, but it was not that big a thing. And one day, brilliantly, I was actually snowed on, but it was very brief and it was actually quite beautiful. Did you create a playlist or books on tape to guide you as you walked? You know, I did not listen to one second of anything in my ears, um, and I did not intend that to happen. I just got so that when I was walking, I didn't really want any interference. So I never listened to books on tape, podcasts, music, anything. I was, I really, we can talk about this more as this goes on, but I became kind of just entranced by thinking and, and looking, and I didn't really want any other distraction. Did you, uh, you took photos, obviously, because we were looking at some of them, but did you record in any other way as you went along? Did you stop to take notes, or did you do it all at the end of the day? That's a good question. You know what I got quite good at was the um, notes function on my phone, which if you get good at it, you can dictate into it. And I would actually do, I'm sitting here now talking to Susan, period, where, you know, and you do, and it would write it out. And so I would take pretty voluminous notes about things as they had just happened or my observations as I went. So at the end of the day, I would have, I don't know, 1,400, 1,500 words kind of in that form. And then my, my pattern was in the morning, I'd usually get up around 5. I was kind of a machine about all this. And I would write a full account of the day before. And I actually sent them out to several hundred people. I had a list of people. I was email. I called them dispatches. They became very popular. Uh, it was pretty funny. And... Uh, it was a great discipline because I really wanted to get a first draft of everything, and then it gave a certain satisfaction. I would then head out at 7.38, knowing I'd already accounted for the day before, and then I kind of repeated it every day. So you're a lone guy walking on some urban and country roads by yourself, and you've posted your route beforehand on social media. Did you ever have any security issues along the way? No, but I had quite a few, seven or eight people that popped up who just recognized that I must be that guy doing this thing. The first one was in York County. I was walking along, it was on Easter Sunday, and I'm walking along the highway on my way from York to Wrightsville on the way to the Susquehanna, and a woman just pulled her car in front in this parking lot and parked, and she jumped out, and she's like, oh my God, are you that guy walking to New York? And it was just so funny. We took like a selfie. I posted it on Twitter. And there were a number of times when that happened. What does that suggest to you about the power of social media? Uh, I mean, it has quite amazing reach. Um, And I was really glad for that, actually, because um, it brought some really interesting people along. Like, I was walking down the Delaware Canal from New Hope to Washington's Crossing, and um, I was starting to think about Washington's Crossing of the Delaware, you know, the Christmas of 1776, which I was going to do the next day. And this guy is walking the other way up, up the towpath, and he's on the phone, and he sees me, and he's like, oh, my God, I've got to go. And then he's like, are you that guy who's walking to New York? And I said, yeah. And he's just we t- he turned, and we started walking together. And for like 25 minutes, we walked, and he started talking to me about Washington's Crossing. And he was quite knowledgeable about what that night was like and the soldiers on the boats. And it was almost like, and I joked with him, I was like, were you sent here to be my tutor in advance of my getting to Washington's Crossing? And he was super helpful on saying, I'm going to leave now, but when you go forward, you can see these graves of 
the patriots that were buried along the river, and he pointed out these things. And there were so many moments like that where people just popped up mysteriously and then suggested things or gave me directions that proved to be really useful. And it seems places to eat along the way. Those two, all kinds of things like that. Mm -hmm. It was really amazing. You also had a, a number of local media interviews along the way. People, again, reporters found you on Twitter and, and interviewed you. What was that process like? You know, none of this did I expect, really. That it, it hit a chord because we were all just kind of breaking out. The mask mandates were pretty strong in most places still. Um, and so the interest was kind of like all like high. So I did an interview in York. I did one in Lancaster for both the print publication and for the television station there. Um, I did one for Bucks County, Pennsylvania, north of Philadelphia. Um, I did several radio-related things on Sirius XMU and some other places. And, <laughs> and then one of the most humorous ones at the end, New York One, which is the big New York station, uh, I had sent them a bunch of videos that I'd taken from the trip, and then they did an interview that they... The, the morning that I crossed over to Manhattan and I was standing along the Hudson and uh, they ran a bunch of the video clips of me you know, kayaking under the Jersey Turnpike and all the crazy stuff and it was a very funny like you know six minute long thing which is pretty long for television You suggest it's because people were just coming out of the pandemic and we've been closer but do you think there's also a quixotic aspect to this that, you're, that you were doing something that people couldn't even think about how they get started on? There was that. I also think there is just an element of fascination that people have with something that resembles a pilgrimage, you know? And um, and I think, unlike if I had chosen a lot of other point A, point B, there was kind of a fascination about that Washington, New York, in part because of what I was already, already talking about, like, why would you do that and how would you do that? So it did stir a lot of interest along those lines. So we're going to go to some of your journey. Great. Now let's go back to the early part. We were looking at that map, and you talked about how rural it gets outside of <clears> Washington, <throat> D.C., on your way to Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, what were the differences that you noticed about the way people live in cities today versus the way people live in rural America? You know, you really um, notice, if you pay attention to the kind of rings of cities, how they're organized, and then how they finally become rural. And I paid a lot of attention to that when I left Washington because it was the, you know, rings of like the sort of wealthier, bigger homeowners. And then you'd go through a ring of like people that had smaller houses that there were a lot of pickup trucks out in front of or like service workers of different kinds. And, and then it started to expand into like the exurbia of the kind of planned developments. And then it started to slowly kind of give way to where I had this kind of building... Um, Suspense for like when I was going to see my first barn or really get the first smell of like bona fide manure and cows and all that. And it took about a day and a half before I actually got into that kind of territory. Um, and then, you know, I got into some, which would make sense, very sparsely populated rural areas, particularly in northern Maryland, going up towards the Mason Dixon line, the border between Maryland and uh, Pennsylvania. That was really a, a fascinating stretch. The um, town names that you posted on Twitter are pretty colorful. Places like Young Man's Fancy, Railroad, Pennsylvania, Freedom, Maryland, New Freedom, Pennsylvania. What do they? What kind of glimpse into a, our past do they give you? You know, I was very fascinated by my approach to that border because, as we all know, it was, you know, for a large portion of our early history, really, really an important border between Maryland and Pennsylvania, and was the border between slavery and the free states. And um, I think that's one of the reasons for this new freedom. And there was a lot of things around in that area that had freedom in their name. Um, Young Man's Fancy was quite funny because it popped up on my phone as a place, but unclear kind of what place. And there was no mention of it on Google or anything like that. And I had to go up this little road called Young Man's Fancy Drive. And I finally got to the top of this kind of hill. And Young Man's Fancy actually was this woman's farm that went back to like the 1830s and someone back in the day had named it Young Man's Fancy. I ran into her. I was like, where's Young Man's Fancy? And she's like, this is it. This is my farm. Um, so that was that was a really funny moment. The Mason-Dixon line uh, was seemed to be of particular interest to you. And here's a picture. Oh, my God. Uh, tell me what we're looking at here. So this was just such an extraordinary find. I was up further on a hill, kind of 
at a distance from this farm. And um, I looked, and that the road there, the two-lane, two, you know, the dirt road, gravel road, that is the Mason-Dixon line, the border between. And you can see it continuing past the house. So that <coughs> is an 1830s stone farmhouse, probably built by a German-American um, not no one has been was living there. You can see the drapes and stuff. I had a feeling that the owners of this farmhouse have a new house up on the hill was kind of my deduction. But I was just so fascinated by the fact that at one time when that person built that farm, that balcony sticking out would have literally been right on the edge of that line between freedom and, and slavery. And it just the whole thing was so poetic. And I spent a fair bit of time just walking around that property and taking photos of it and videos and the like. You can see the well. It's just such an amazingly well-preserved remnant from that time. You wrote of the Mason-Dixon line that you thought about it so much that you actually even dreamt about it. Why do you think it was so intriguing to you? Um, I guess because of uh, you know what it means in our history and for the number of people that um, where the crossing of it was such a a dream in their own right or such a huge thing and a terrifying thing to make that journey. Um, and when you're walking along those roads, it's easy to identify in some ways with what that would have been like just because you can look at the woods and figure how people would have had to have tried to scramble from place to place and whether they would trust some farmer or some house along the way for being kind of on their side or not. And it's just a, a very powerful symbol in our history. When you got to York, Pennsylvania, the graffiti there intrigued you. We've got your photograph of that uh, yeah. to look at. Why was graffiti of particular interest? Well, I'd spent a day, actually, with a really interesting um, Jim McClure, who is a um, really great popular historian there, former uh, newspaper editor. He took me all around, including to this wall, which is very is quite a large wall, and it basically changes, not daily. He called it the city's daily newspaper, and people come and just change things according to what events are going on. I can't really quite interpret what this is right now, but um, and this is something that's essentially sanctioned by the city. It's actually a pedestrian bridge that goes over a rail line. Um, then I just found that to be interesting and a colorful thing. What about graffiti in general as you walk through urban areas? Did you have any reaction to its prevalence or what it's doing to expression in cities? Yeah, you know, I didn't spend, you know, it's interesting, the whole kind of painting on walls because like when you get to Philadelphia which has a very robust tradition of murals on walls I mean it's like a huge part of the city there um, there was a lot of that kind of public art um, I did see a lot of um, graffiti along the roadways right people who like to leave their names or tags or whatever on railroad bridges and that kind of thing it wasn't something I paid huge amounts of attention to though really some things that did seem to catch your attention frequently one old cemeteries oh yeah I spent a lot of time in cemeteries. Why? Well, they tell you a lot about the place you're going through in terms of their early settlements and the, the names that show, obviously, a lot of what the ethnic makeup of the people were. Um, I also just find them fascinating because um, what they just say about time and the evolution of time. And, you know, you go into some crumbling, falling apart cemetery and where the gravestones are toppling and they're filled with all these... Um, you will never be forgotten kind of sentiments, and turns out they have been rather forgotten. Um, but, uh, you know, I also was really fascinated. I went to one cemetery, because it was near Young Man's Fancy, where um, I noticed this bizarre moment where up through the 19-teens, the standard for all of the graves was if somebody died at 72, they would say 72 years, 4 months, and 23 days. Mm-hmm. Whatever their, however many years they had lived, they would always say years, month, days. Sometime around 1916, 1917, that went away, and they stopped doing that. I still want to try to figure out why, but there's so many disinteresting clues in cemeteries. Another fascination seemed to be rivers and bridges. Oh, yeah. You crossed the Susquehanna and the Delaware. We've got a photograph of one of those crossings. Why were rivers and bridges so fascinating? You know, so, yeah, well, look at that one. I mean, that's just so powerful. That is the, this is the 1930s era bridge that goes over the Susquehanna, which is actually carrying the Lincoln Highway, which was built around that time, um, or sort of established around that time. Those are the footings for what was actually a series of bridges over the years, including some of the footings from the Civil War era bridge, which they 
set on fire so the Confederate forces could not get across the Susquehanna. The other bridge is the Highway 30, the bigger highway bridge. But in the old days, that river, the Susquehanna, which is one of the largest, or sorry, the oldest rivers in the world, was the ultimate frontier. It was difficult to cross. Getting across it meant you were in a different place, markedly different place. Um, and it was, um, you know, these kind of river crossings were just of huge importance, and people would spend hours or even days there waiting for a ferry to take them across or whatever. Now we just blaze over these these bridges. So I spent some time there. I actually even went swimming in the, <laughs> in the, in the river. It was rather cold, but I just took a dip because I felt like I had to. That was Easter Sunday. Um, but um, I felt this kind of reverence every time I got to these big rivers because they're of such vital importance to the history of our country. And now, because our transportation methods and trains and everything else have moved on, we don't rely on them in the way that we did. But um, they're really worthy of a lot of respect. Between York, Pennsylvania and Philadelphia lies Lancaster County, you seemed quite taken by several experiences there. First of all, uh, you wrote about Thaddeus Stevens and James Buchanan. Yeah, so I walked into Lancaster, the town of Lancaster, and it's just such a you know, a potent moment in our history overall. James Buchanan, as many people might know, was the the last president before the Civil War. Um, he was very much of a Southern sympathizing um, Pennsylvanian. People called him a doe face. They called those kinds of Democrats doe faces. Um, he was, some people say, the worst president. I would say more kind of the tr- most tragic president because I don't think there was much he could have done either way to keep things from going the way they did. Thaddeus Stevens on the other hand, was a incredible, fiery abolitionist, um, really a truly righteous person. Both of them were lawyers, both lived in the same town. Thaddeus Stevens, I think many people would argue, was one of the two or three most important people in the 19th century. Because of him, um, Lincoln was really convinced to do the Emancipation Proclamation, and not him, but those who came after he was assassinated, to push forward on Reconstruction for the length of time that that lasted. And Stevens was just instrumental in the House of Representatives as a congressman. So, I'm sorry, but in Lancaster, there was this seesawing of who mattered and whose reputation was going up and whose was going down. And James Buchanan, the only president from Pennsylvania, his reputation very much um, kind of in the doghouse. And Thaddeus Stevens is about to undergo this big renaissance there. I have to correct you because there's now a second president from Pennsylvania. Joe Biden, born in Scranton. Oh, good, interesting point. Yeah, yes. You can tell I I'm not Pennsylvanian, so <laughs> yes, <laughs> get yes. that point in. Up until that point, good point, yes. Uh, so the, uh, the other group of people that you took a lot of photographs and wrote about were the Mennonites. Um, so for people that aren't familiar, what's the Mennonite religion? So there were these groups of different kinds of Anabaptists who uh, came to uh, the United States um, mainly in the 1700s from different parts of Northern Europe um, who were, you know, kind of, breakaway sect from mainline Protestantism and had different views on when you should be baptized and so on, and went through a lot of grief as a result. So the Quakers and the other founders of Pennsylvania were very welcoming to all these different religious sects. So the Amish and the Mennonites were the first big settlers of Lancaster County. It's an amazing place still to this day, because when you go there, you are in many ways going back in time. A lot of these people, particularly the Amish, stick to their horses and it was a fantastic two days when I walked through because they were plowing the fields and using uh, mules for that. Um, there's a lot of differences between them in terms of uh, you know, their own accommodations with modernity. I didn't have much interactions with the Amish, they're more standoffish. The Mennonites, uh, on the other hand, I had some just fantastic encounters with people along the way. I have a couple pictures from this period because I could tell from the enthusiasm of your postings that this was a special time. So what are we seeing here? So this was a guy who obviously is a horseshoer, a farrier, they're called, and I saw his sign out on the on the highway, and I could hear that he was horseshoeing, so I went in, and I ended up spending about 45 minutes and watched him shoe that horse. It was fantastic, because the guy whose horse that was, his buggy, was right outside. You can see he's all, um, you know, equipped to, to pull that buggy, and we just sat there and talked, and he was very welcoming, and uh, he gave me like a satchel of cookies when I left, and that was a fantastic conversation we had to actually have a long conversation about what was going on in the world. Or so you just walked up and introduced yourself. I just walked in his door, and he said, "Well, what do we have here?" Because he found it just 
bizarre that just some stranger was walking in with a backpack on. Um, but he was extremely welcoming, and we and we had it was just a really really fun conversation. We have photos of Mennonite children that oh, you yeah. you experienced as well. Let's take a look at those. So. <laughs> This is just an amazing sequence of events. I'm walking along this road, and I just glance across. I'm coming past this um, school. It's like a fairly large Mennonite school. And I see these kids playing softball. And I go back into the play area, and there are two diamonds. They're playing this very rowdy, very aggressive, full-on form of softball. All the young women are wearing full-length floral dresses and little kind of white bonnets on their head. And they are incredible softball players. It was very aggressive. They were sliding into bases, the whole nine yards. And I was just in awe. And then at the end, when the, the bell rang, recess was over, they all came over. Their teacher came over. He asked what I was up to. When I told him, he then wanted me to give a talk to the kids. They all gathered around. At the end of that, after about 10 minutes or so, one of the girls proposed, one of the young women proposed to the teacher that they sing for me, which just completely astonished me. I went into the school and downstairs into their choir room, and they ended up singing two Mennonite hymns for me. And it was just such an amazing moment because um, it was really their way of just thanking me for being there. And it had come completely unprompted from the kids themselves, and they were overjoyed to do it, and I was just really blown away. You posted a, a, a sketch of a historical character I'd never heard of before from that region called Benjamin Lay. Who was Benjamin you Lay? You know, this is one of the things that goes along kind of with the Thaddeus Stevens thing, where uh, I really wanted to go out of my way to sort of pay homage to these people. And Benjamin Lay was a, he was about four foot tall. He was a hunchback dwarf, essentially, um, Quaker, very fiery, strongly anti uh, slavery abolitionist. And he, in the end, was actually essentially pushed out of his Quaker meeting house, which is north of Philadelphia. Um, he died before, well before the, the Revolution, but he was friends with Benjamin Franklin. And he was actually, you know, the Quakers, if I remember right, it was right around the 1870s, for, swore off all slavery in their own right, and then became a major force pushing against slavery, particularly in Pennsylvania, but elsewhere across the country. And one of the main reasons was Benjamin Lay, because he was such a fervent advocate of, for eliminating slavery. Pretty much lost to history. He is a truly extraordinary character. The, from there into Philadelphia, starting to get into urban environment, were you happy to be getting out of the country and into urban? Or, or You know, I was regretful to leave Lancaster County because it was so extraordinary. And um, I was a little apprehensive about kind of what it would mean to be getting into more kind of freeway-ish areas of the country. But in reality... A lot of that was really kind of wrong. What I thought was coming up wasn't quite as congested as I thought it was going to be. Because and of the pandemic, do you think? Well, no, just because part of it was the routes I took. I wasn't. It was not until, I don't know, a week and a half later when I had my encounter with I-95, uh, which was a moment I was really anticipating um, with a little bit of dread but a lot of fascination, um, that I get into kind of the truly more sort of trafficked area of the country. And by then I was, you know... 40 miles from New York and kind of that part of New Jersey. Philadelphia has the, uh, the Schuylkill River, and one of the famous sites along it is the uh, Victorian er- er- era boathouses yep. along the river. You made some musings on social media about the change in American life from hard work to more leisure activities. What were you thinking about when you saw those? You know, it's fascinating, but when you look at our history, um, which is sort of two things going on in the second half of the 19th century. One is the coming and then going of the Civil War. The other is, of course, the industrialization and the creating of a different kind of workforce, which then brought about kind of more the existence of weekends and looking at countryside as a place to go to for leisure. So it was really the beginning of kind of fun in a more organized way and athletics in a more organized way. So baseball, golf, all these things kind of of horse racing. Um, And the boathouses there along the Schuylkill there was one, as I recall, looking at them that had come, that had been built in 1859. So it was just before the Civil War. All of the others were 1865 and after, and that became kind of the mecca for that particular kind of rowing, that organized rowing. But it was, I was mainly making the point that right then, eight, late 1860s was really kind of the beginning of um, fun in America in some ways. North of Philadelphia, Doylestown, there's a stop at something called the Mercer Museum. Oh yeah. 
got a photograph of that. It seemed like it was a significant stop for you. Where are you in this picture? Oh, well, that one, that, okay. So Mercer, this guy, Henry Chapman Mercer, was this fascinating figure, and this was actually the studio of his tile works. It turns out that I know the woman who just recently took over this tile works um, and is running it, and she did me a very solid favor by insisting that I sleep there. So that bed, uh, this is not a, a lodging. She turned it into a lodging for the night, and it was this just sort of medieval setting. It had a big fireplace off to the side that you can't see there. And I got to spend the night there, and it was cre- incredibly amazing. The Mercer Museum is downtown, not this same site. And Mercer's whole thing, he had many aspects to him, was that he was very eager to preserve and save parts of American heritage before they were just completely consumed by the Industrial Revolution. So grist mills and cider mills and saws. and he created. So... He went around the country and even around the world in some ways and collected the axes and saws and everything that we had used to create the country and created this museum, which I highly recommend people go to. It is something unlike any other museum. Henry Ford said back in the day that it was the only museum worth visiting in America, and he kind of did his own version of it in Detroit. So he made his money from the tile works? That he was us? kind of independently wealthy, but in the end he, he was a very famous tile maker at the time, and yeah, he did. And he has a quite a wild mansion right next to the tile works. It's also worth visiting. So the next era puts you right in the footsteps of George Washington. Two stops we're going to talk about, Valley Forge and New Hope. Let's start with Valley Forge. Yeah. So the fascinating thing, I went to Valley Forge. <laughs> Those are the kind of very made and um, you know rough replica of the sort of places that the troops actually stayed that winter. I was fascinated by Valley Forge. It's become an iconic place in our history, obviously, 76, 77, that winter. Washington and his troops, Lafayette, um, they were wintering there. There was not a battle there. But I wanted to go there to understand how and when we decided to care about Valley Forge. And so I met a really great historian there, Lorette Trees, and she took me around. She's written about that thing, not the winter of 76, 77, but when we decided to care about Valley Forge. It took about a century before we even cared about that place and started to memorialize it and expand it. And now, of course, it's a major attraction. But that kind of layering of like when we care and then how we recognize the th- events that occurred there is just, I think, really interesting to look at. Oh, and then you were, what was the other one? New Washington? Hope. A oh, New Hope. Um, so New Hope actually was, actually, it was more reaching the Delaware. And then, yeah, so this was standing on the river, the bridge that goes from across uh, the Delaware from New Hope. And this is where Washington's Crossing happened? Washington's Crossing is actually south of here. So I walked that afternoon down to Washington's Crossing, and I, uh, a friend of mine had come down from New York with two kayaks, and we um, kayaked across right where George Washington had crossed on, New Year, on Christmas Eve of 1776. Um, very different weather. Very different circumstances. <laughs> uh, we weren't standing up, um, but it was really fun. And I was actually greeted on the other side by a hiking club that um, had come there. There were like 15 people, and it was really, it was really funny and charming that they had shown up there. They came to meet you. Yes. Yeah. So, in George Washington's <laughs> footsteps is uh, a, another person that's beginning to be viewed through certain different lenses now because of his slaveholding. Uh, I'm wondering what you were thinking about George Washington and his contributions to our country as you were following in his footsteps. Yeah, I know. It's so fascinating, all of those things, because I I, I totally welcome and applaud our way more nuanced, not just nuanced, but just wide-eyed understanding of what these people were. And it is a reality that Washington was a major slaveholder and not a particularly benevolent one, really, even though he did, in his will, free his slaves when he died. But, you know, the thing that fascinated me that were not things that I really knew that much about Washington. When the, the Revolutionary War really started in 1775, he left Mount Vernon and led the Continental Army without once going home until, I think he went home once briefly in 1781. He was gone perpetually for six years trying to keep that effort going which is really just quite amazing. And the degree to which, I mean, we look at him as, you know, the ultimate founding father, and I think most people would make the argument that had it not been for his sort of stubbornness in keeping that small band of, of you know, patriot, patriot 
soldiers together, particularly in that first six or seven months, um, it could easily have fallen apart. And that that aspect of it, I, I came to understand a lot better. So the I-95 corridor from Philadelphia up to New York, many <clears throat> New Jerseyans identify themselves by what exit they live yes. off of in New Jersey. What was your experience like walking that on, by foot? So I have focused on this place called Cranberry, um, which is a really fascinating town. It's on, I think, exit 8A. Um, it is a very, some of the people there, I, I spent a good morning there, and I met with a bunch of history, historical people who were saying it was the best preserved 19th century town in America. It is spotless, and it, the freeway is right there. And I was really fascinated by that place because you have this perfectly preserved 19th century Cranberry, and then right on the edge of town is this sort of sea of huge distribution warehouses, Amazon, Costco, Wayfair, all those things. And then I had decided that I wanted to go between those warehouses and then under the Bri- under the Jersey Turnpike on this brook called Cranberry Brook. And uh, long story short, it was going to be impossible to do it on foot, but the people in Cranberry that I met made a big point of saying, you're going to borrow one of their, uh, one of actually this woman's son's kayak. And I went up the river on a kayak underneath the Jersey Turnpike on a kayak. It took me about 40 minutes to get up there. What was it like under there? It was, the whole thing was amazing because I was going up a river that I think, except for the quality of the water, was probably totally unchanged for a thousand years. It was the most mysterious stretch of the entire trip in a lot of ways. Very, these big lily pads and blue herons and geese and ducks of all kinds. And then I finally, and I had to portage a few times over fallen trees, and then I actually went under the all 12 lanes or whatever of the Jersey Turnpike, which was cacophonous and loud. And then I got to the other side, pulled it up, left it there. This guy came back later that day and recovered it and brought it back, and on I went. Um, and I was now very distinctly in a different place, having gotten to the other side of the Jersey Turnpike. So you could have approached New York from a couple of different ways. Why did you decide to go into New York through Staten Island? You know, that was really an important thing because I spent a lot of time trying to understand how the colonial sort of pre-train era people made the trip from Washington, D.C. to New York, and that's what they did. They would go up Philadelphia, they would go across the Delaware, they would go up through Cranberry, they would end up going up to South Amboy, they would cross the Raritan River, and then they would go across to Staten Island and then make their way up and then finally go across the Hudson, basically where Jersey City is now. And I really wanted to mirror that exact route, which I did. It took some doing, though, by the way. Well, one person that helped you with it was somebody named Stu Conway. Oh, yeah. I, I think we have a little video that we can show of Stu Conway and how he helped you out with this part of your journey. <laughs> On the peanut. peanut. <laughs> That's so... That, so tell us about this. So that <laughs> is uh, Perth Amboy across the way. I had to get across this, which is called the Arthur Kill. I went down to the Raritan Yacht Club in, in Perth Amboy, see RYC, Raritan Yacht Club, and I had to just mooch a ride, and it was the afternoon before, and I went there, and I just started talking to people. I said, who might be willing to take me across the Arthur Kill? And somebody said, I think I know a guy who might do it. So I got a hold of this guy, Stu Conway, who had sailed around the world, fantastic person. He and his his friend Brad um, came in that morning uh, and they said, oh, he said, I'll meet you there on the dock at 9 o'clock. I'll take you across. You could see it was quite windy. It was actually kind of treacherous, the conditions a bit. And he took me across in that little launch. They had driven an hour into Perth Amboy to do that for me. Didn't know me from anybody. Just wanted to do somebody a favor. That was, that was a great moment. So when you got to Staten Island, it was important for you to see it. What did you see? You know, Staten Island's a fascinating place. A lot of people think of it as like the place where the Fresh Kills landfill is, which is a famous landfill, which has now been turned into a kind of nature park of sorts. Um, It's a very um, mixed place. It really is kind of all of America in one island because there are parts of it that are wild and pretty untouched in ways. There are places that are distinctly rural. There's places that are very kind of cookie-cutter, suburban, you know, uh, housing. There's parts of it that are quite urban. It's it's the borough that's the least understood by far of any of the New York boroughs. And I had never walked through it in that way. And I found also a lot of really bizarre pockets that very few New Yorkers probably are aware of. And uh, I had a great time. I, I walked, what, 13, 12, 13 miles through Staten Island that day. 
And how many days into the trip were you at this point? I was uh, two days away from being done at that point, so I was like day 24, I think. We've got the photograph of your first view of Manhattan. Oh, my God, yeah. What was, I mean, after all this time, what was your emotion about seeing the city? You know, it's funny. You see that picture, and it's like, yeah, okay, Manhattan. But I was coming up the, um, the Bayonne Bridge there, and I wasn't anticipating it being there for some reason. I was just walking up the pedestrian ramp, and when I saw it, I was just really just totally overwhelmed, and I sat there for 20 minutes just taking it in. And you could see the shimmer of the, of the, of the harbor, um, and, you know, it, it brings to mind these kind of F. Scott Fitzgerald sort of quotes about um, the kind of ever-renewing nature of New York and just its beauty. And, you know, this is a city that's been through so much through the COVID period, but when you see it there, it just looks so unscathed. Um, and I was just sort of overwhelmed by the sight of it. Another river that you had to cross. Oh, and yeah. Another person who helped you out. This is Kevin Murray. Uh, what was his role in your journey? So Kevin was a fantastic... Um, well, he took that picture. Of that, you, that, yeah. Yes. So Kevin, I tracked down. He runs a place called Urban Paddle, which is in Jersey City. It's a kayak operation. Uh, he was originally, we were going to go across the river in a kayak. It got really windy. The chop was pretty severe. So in the end, he borrowed a Boston whaler and took me across. And uh, Kevin is a fantastic person, one of many I owe thanks to. And uh, so he took me across to a marina in that boat. Did you pass the Statue of Liberty there? Off to the right, we did, yeah. And that was quite a sight. And then we came into the marina, North Cove Marina, that's right by the 9-11 site, which I was sort of shocked I hadn't visited. Um, and I covered 9-11 for, for the Wall Street Journal, and um, so it was quite powerful just to go there. And, you know, that was sort of the beginning of my five-hour walk through Manhattan, which was also quite moving for starting. You know, I was really struck because I had been to so many monuments, so many memorials. It was the first one, unless I'm missing something, that I'd been to that memorialized something that so many of us, you know, experienced in very vivid ways and has left a mark on our country and all of our lives. So it was quite something to just be there and take that site in. It's, it's, it's quite a powerful place. How did you bookend the trip? What did you say, I'm done? Where was your final, <laughs> final spot? You know, my wa- I'd always kind of joke that it was going to be a ramble to the Ramble, which is the famous area of Central Park that Frederick Law Olmsted designed that has all these twisting paths. And um, so in some ways I kind of said, okay, I'm, I, when I got to the Ramble and walked through those twisting paths, um, I'd sort of officially ended. But truth be told, the real end of the walk was when I met my wife, who was walking down from Central Park, um, Northern Central Park, and I came along the reservoir. And it was just an incredible day. I think I don't can't say this for certain, but that it was the first totally explosive sort of spring. We're going to get out of this. We're going to survive. The place was packed. All the you know couples were out on the rowboats on the lake and all that kind of stuff. And the blossoms were crazy and. It was great seeing my wife, and that was sort of the official end of the trip. We have uh, about four minutes left and two wrap-up questions, both based on things you've posted. My walk to New York taught me many things, almost too many to count. What are some of those? You know, I think the chief things are, I I like to say, the primacy of place and the value of place in American life and the the concept of common ground, Um, the importance of talking to people on the same patch of ground, no matter how different we might be. I had a lot of conversations with people whose politics I might necessarily agree with or appreciate, but who I really enjoyed spending time with. And also just the sort of slowing down. I I, I said to people that it's an easy calculation. Walking is 20 times slower than driving, three miles an hour versus 60 miles an hour. It's at least 20 times as rich and 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 valuable in what you encounter. so there was that. There was also the the openness that I felt, just sort of spiritual openness over time that the walking gave me. So that when I saw, you know, the image of Manhattan there, it left an impact on me that was kind of surreal and almost religious that would probably not have happened if I hadn't walked for 25 days to get to that place. Here's one a last thought you wrote. I com- completed my 26-day ramble from D.C. to New York. If any one line stands out, it's the one recited to me by a Mennonite teacher in Lancaster County. Quote, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yeah. Um, 
That was actually in the basement of the church. <clears throat> Sorry, of the uh, school where those kids sang to me. And I asked him, uh, Neil Weaver, to sort of explain their faith. And he read that line to me, which is a, anybody who's a New Testament person is going to recognize. Um, I was not that familiar with it. It's a line of St. Paul to the Romans. And um, it's a fascinating line because it's basically saying, don't let the world form you. Form yourself, transform yourself through a renewing of your mind, refreshing, a re- renewing of your mind, which is a constant process. And to me, the walk really resembled, was a renewing of my mind in many ways. And, um, you know, it was a, something I would wish on a lot of people to do something similar to that because it, um, it did leave an impact. Next is to create this into a book. When will that happen? Uh, over the next few months. I'm hoping it will be uh, sold and, you know, I'll find a publisher in the, in the next few days even, for that matter. And then uh, I'll have five or six months to put all this stuff together. I've already written a lot of stuff for it. And um, I do. I definitely want to expand some of its historical aspects and some of the more kind of philosophical rumination side of it. But the core of it, which was just the incredible people I met and the really extraordinary, spectacular, unexpectedly beautiful sites along the way, pretty trafficked part of the country, right? People say, oh, I kind of already feel like I know that place. But we don't. And uh, so I think the book is going to drive home some of those points. Neil King, Jr., it's been a while since you've been on C-SPAN, but we're delighted to have you back for an hour this week. Thanks for joining us. It's really a pleasure. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. And subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast, so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome.